People don't like computers being better than us at things. For years, the question on everyone's mind was, can they beat us at chess? And we all know how that turned out. More recently, it's become, can they compose better music than us? Computers have been writing AI compositions since around 1960. Here's one of their first ever public performances. Although people find this kind of thing intriguing, it also makes them a bit uncomfortable. They don't like the idea that a cold, calculating machine might come up with something beautiful and moving. And for the same sorts of reasons, those same people think us human composers shouldn't be too calculating. A real composer can be found walking across a windswept moor, or sitting in a summer chalet gazing into the distance, waiting for inspiration to arrive. Good ideas aren't made by algorithms, they arrive mystically through the ether. One of the reasons many 20th century classical composers are mistrusted is because they're seen as too calculating. For example, this guy, Yanis Xenarchis, he used scientific theories like Maxwell and Botsman's kinetic theory of gases, or equations predicting the Brownian motions of particles. He'd take reams of data from computer printouts and use them to generate music. Each particle bouncing around the science lab became a pizzicato or a glissando in his compositions. It certainly doesn't seem like a notion of composing most of us are particularly comfortable with. But actually, calculation has some kind of role to play in most kinds of composition. The fact is, for us human composers, composing is really hard work. So if there's an algorithm out there that will make things a little easier for us, we'll grab onto it. These days you only hear about algorithms when it comes to ranking YouTube videos or showing ads in your Facebook feed. But an algorithm is really just a series of steps that are used to solve a particular problem, just like, say, a recipe. Take four colourful chords, sprinkle with pentatonic melody, add in a splash of funky beat, and turn up the heat. It's easiest to get a sense of this recipe idea when you're looking at mechanisms for recreating existing styles of music. For example, in the 1860s, the quadrille was a popular style of dance. The compositions at these things were fairly predictable and, well, followed a series of rules. So much so that a guy called John Clinton realised you might be able to generate them using some kind of system. And he developed the quadrille melodist. 428 quadrilles for five shillings and sixpence. This was a card-based system. It had a series of predefined slots outlining the shape of the dance, and each slot had 11 different cards that you could swap around to create a different tune. So here's one version. And then we'll swap out all the odd-numbered cards, and a new tune emerges. So Clinton had worked out some of the essential characteristics of the quadrille and distilled them into a recipe for creating an almost limitless supply of them. Mozart did something similar with his musical dice game. Yeah, but I did it first. So what's the modern equivalent of this? Well, it's probably the Markov chain, which analyzes existing music and uses probability instead of dice throwing to generate the next note. There are a large number of other AI computer composers out there, all working on new recipes, but all rely on a good supply of musical data to feed off. This means some composers' styles are easier to recreate than others. Basically, Chopin mazurkas, of which there are 56, and they're all in the same style. That's great, that's perfect. But if you're going to take um, The Planets by Gustav Holst, for example, Planets. there's no way to go. I mean, there's Planets. only one of them, and there's not a, none of the rest of his works are anything like that particular one. So you put that in the database, you're going to get out something that pretty much sounds like that, that data. So the algorithms used in those kind of machine learning programs and in simple games like the quadrille cards are good at imitating existing styles. They're kind of trying to reverse engineer existing music and recreate it. They're not really going to help you write something original. But there are other kinds that can. 
I think the first known attempt at serious algorithmic composition was taken almost exactly a thousand years ago by Guido d'Arezzo, the same bloke that invented music notation. For his algorithm, you assign a specific note to each vowel, a, a, e, o, u. find a piece of text you want to set to music, find each vowel in the text, and map the appropriate pitch onto that vowel. Arbitrary, you might think, but the results sound surprisingly good. Sancte Johannes Meritorum Tuorum Copias neque O digne carere This is an example of what's known as the translational model of algorithms, where you take the information or data that's available in one area, in this case the vowels in the text, and translate them into some aspect of your music. You could do the same with colours in a painting or the structure of a poem, but it helps if there's some kind of logic to the translation. In Guido's case, he felt that music should honour and heighten the significance of the words, so finding a melody that matches the shape of the vowel sounds makes some kind of sense. Another algorithmic model, and probably the most commonly used, is mathematics, using some kind of equations to generate your music. And this is particularly good, of course, for generating rhythms. So this beat was generated using a plug-in on a digital audio workstation that creates what's called a Euclidean rhythm. To make one of these, you set the length of your pattern and you select how many beats to sound within the pattern. And the plugin uses some fairly simple maths to spread the beat out as evenly as possible. What's interesting about this is that many of the resulting rhythms are found in world music. Three beats within an eight loop becomes a Cuban tresillo, or five is the cinquillo. Seven beats in a 12 loop is a common West African bell pattern. Seven in 16 can be found in Brazilian samba. And these kind of patterns can then be rotated around the loop to make new versions of the same sequence. If we change the sound to marimba and start overlapping a few of them, we pretty quickly have our own instant Steve Reich piece. So you can imagine how useful this can be for generating new rhythmic ideas. And it's all using this one mathematical model. If you're interested in exploring other models, I highly recommend the Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences which is a huge collection of all sorts of different number sequences, 300,000 of them, I believe. As well as the raw data, the website also has graphs and MIDI renderings of all of the sequences. I'm just going to mention two which have a particular relevance to music. First is the Rackerman sequence, which uses a very simple rule to generate a fascinating series of patterns, as visualised in this beautiful illustration from the number file video on the sequence. It's got that mixture of order and chaos which seems very artistic, very human. Here's the same pattern expressed as MIDI data, where one is the lowest note on the piano and two is a half step above. But of course this is only the simplest of an infinite number of ways you could translate the same sequence into different music. You could apply them to modes, you could generate rhythms, even forms. The second sequence I want to mention was actually invented or discovered by a composer. It's the so-called Infinity series created by the Danish composer Per Norga. It's a pretty amazing fractal-like pattern that contains replicas of itself at multiple levels. So this sequence at the start and every subsequent note of the series that follows it can also be found by taking every four notes and every 16 notes and so on, as well as an inverted form here and here. It's pretty mind boggling. But again, you don't have to translate the numbers just into pitches. Here's a rhythm I created simply by separating out the upper and lower parts of the sequence. You can hear Norgar's own use of the Infinity series in his piece Voyage into the Golden Screen. Now of course there are lots more different kinds of algorithmic approaches we could look at. We haven't even discussed the medieval practice of isorhythm. But I'd like to end with a much simpler kind of algorithmic approach taken by the contemporary Estonian composer Arvo Pärt. Pärt's music often sounds closer to something Guido might have written than anything contemporary, perhaps because he has similar spiritual goals. He was trying to get music back to basics to access its innermost spirit. The system he developed called Tintinabulation had just two parts, one melodic and one that was limited to picking out notes from a minor chord. By limiting himself so much, the music takes on a stillness, a solemnity, a sense of ritual.
And this is probably one of the key advantages of algorithms. They give you some kind of limitation, something to work against as an artist. The trouble with musical algorithms is they're misunderstood. People assume they're only good for computers or extreme kinds of academic music. But musical algorithms aren't inherently good or bad. They don't determine the style of music you'll write. And to prove it, I took some of Xenarchus's computer data from that piece we heard earlier and used it to generate these lush string chords. Algorithms don't take the decision making out of the composing process, but they can point you in new directions you might not otherwise have thought of. A special thank you to Ben Levin and Matthew Rose, who you'll see in a minute, for both singing that phrase from Guido. Thank you so much to my patrons on Patreon for making all of this possible. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Sancti